I have always felt inherently female. You feel that there's something wrong and you don't feel like other boys, but I never did anything about it. I mean, it took me until 2006 to be able to confide in a GP. The relationship between a GP and families and, and patients was very different, I think, to how it is now. We didn't worry so much about confidentiality, you know, data protection and that kind of thing. Once I realised, you know, on you know, the nature of the relationship between um, my parents and GP, that put a stop straight away on my ever mentioning anything like this to my parents or to the GP, so I didn't. What I did do, of course, was um, I, what other people would call cross-dressed. Um, so that, uh, and I did that in secret. The, the discrimination probably comes in school days through bullying and a perception of peers that I was different. And I lived the first 47 years or so of my life not knowing what to do about it. This in and of itself is not a mental health issue. It only becomes one when you suppress it for a long time and then you sink into depression. And at its worst, that spiral of depression is very difficult to get out of. I think it's vitally important that um, organisations work together to raise awareness. Gender identity disorder and all the issues, all the hardships that we face, want to overcome the condition, to come to terms with it, and also to raise awareness of what we have to go through to address the the condition and go through the, the processes which lead up to the gender confirmation surgery. We don't choose to go through this. We have to. Our own sanity dis dictates that. And um, my confidence levels have gone through the roof. I've never had confidence before. I've been shy, I've been retiring, withdrawn, sullen, moody, depressed. And it's important that we bring groups together, that people like myself are given opportunities like this where we can um, tell it how it really is. When I started working in the South West, that was a real eye-opener. People really hadn't grasped what it meant to have an inclusive workplace. I encountered very subtle forms of racism and overt forms of racism much later on. But what was really hard was when I was encountering the um, subtler forms of racism, I felt as though I was explaining to people what I was encountering on a day-to-day -day basis and they weren't listening. As a woman in the South West, there is a perception that somehow women's issues are not relevant or they're not important. Um, I think there's a lot of discrimination that is overlooked because it's seen to be the norm or just the way things are. And um, that's hard because it's quite limiting. I became involved with Equality Southwest by going to one of their conferences and I was really impressed by the commitment that Equality Southwest had to um, pushing forward agendas for equality um, and later became involved in the Race Equality Forum, um, which um, similarly has been a really important networking group um, because in the Southwest. Uh, particularly at the rural areas, um, it's, it's very difficult to make the connections with other black and minority ethnic people. And um, it was really a wonderful experience to go there, both to the Women's Forum and to um, the BME Forum. The, the Heart Institute is a fantastic building. 
Um, it's providing you know, absolute first-rate care for people suffering with heart problems in, in Bristol and, and throughout the region, actually. And for me, the important thing about why I wanted to be interviewed here was to just demonstrate that disabled people, you know, we work and we do lots, lots of other things. And for me, it's really, I'm really passionate about my role on the hospital and I wanted other people to see, see a bit of what goes on here. I was elected when I was 25 onto the council in Bristol. Um, I stood in a seat that was sort of meant, seen as non-winnable. In May 2006, just after an election I was involved in, I was off the council then, but I was helping in, in local elections. On the Saturday I took my motorcycle out for the first time and ended up uh, uh, getting it wrong on a roundabout and ended up through a shop window at 60 miles an hour. It's coming around and realising you're paralysed and that's quite a shocking thing to cope with. I mean, um, and then just going through the process, you know, going through sort of surviving it, so staying in, in intensive care through to kind of being on a general ward, then going through rehab, is all about sort of adjusting your life. And I must say, and this, people may not kind of believe this or not, they allow them to, to make their own minds up, but I've not had a down moment at all. I've just sort of accepted it and moved on. And but I think that's kind of what I was like in life, actually. It's just willing to get on with it, the, the, you know, the job in hand, and just make the most of it. And so it's not a liberating thing. It's tough, right? It's not, you know, I wouldn't ever say that, uh, you know, I'm a better person for it or anything else. Um, and it's damn hard on cer certain days. But all that, I'm not going to make my life harder by feel dwelling on my disability. In terms of my work and more generally, um, yeah, there's small things that obviously you've got to be, you more planning, I hate that, more planning to do things. I mean, you know, it's really interesting that when you take the train, they say you've got to ring up 24 hours in advance, you've got to book it. I never bother with that, I just turn up and tell them they've got to get me on the train. So, so in a sense, you can allow this to affect your life more than perhaps what I allow it to affect it. So you've also got to kind of just push against some of that and just get on with it. The discrimination that I've suffered with, one small instance where, where uh, I was, there was a line of people queued up for a disabled toilet, I just jumped the queue, went straight, there was just able-bodied people. I jumped the queue and I had some hassle from people in the queue. Now I'm kind of, you know, bold and brash enough to, to, to deal with that. Um, but, you know, other people may really find that difficult and, and uh, may undermine their sort of self-confidence. So Equality South West, the reason why for me it's so important is two, two main reasons, okay? It's one is coordinating the different organisations throughout the uh, region and doing that make sure we lobby the public sector and private sector to ensure that our agenda is listened to. Um, and, and secondly, it's sharing best practice, making sure that organisations don't go off down sort of certain avenues without actually listening to what other organisations have done and, what, and making sure we, we build on what works throughout the region. So for me, those are the two most important things of, Quality Southwest and the reason why it should continue its work. There is um, a sea of change. It may be in it relatively in its infancy, but it is there. There are sort of instances of discrimination that people suffer with, you know, across 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 our region. That's why Quality Southwest is so important in the work they they do to kind of uh, combat it. Sometimes it's really really helpful to know that a body like Equality Southwest is working. Um, with organisations, public sector organisations, voluntary sector organisations, private sector organisations to help raise the awareness of people um, who are um, decision makers within those organisations about what it means to create the conditions where all human beings can flourish in the South West and all human beings can reach their potential irrespective of who they are. I think we all deserve that.